All right, everyone. Um, this is going to be my review for uh, Biology 261, folks, for the autonomic nervous system. Um, here we go. So one of the fundamental questions that you should be able to answer is how the ANS is different from the somatic division. And this table outlines some of the more important features that you want to uh, make sure that you review. Uh, we're going to be looking at this first one here um, in a little bit more detail here in a second, uh, as well as the neurotransmitters. Keep in mind that the somatic division only innervates skeletal muscle, and the autonomic division is basically talking to everything else in the body. Um, there are also differences in the specialization of the, um, the synapses. For example, the somatic division has uh, very, very specialized axon terminals. Uh, motor end plates and so forth. Um, whereas in the autonomic division, we don't really see that. There, there's just a lot of uh, what we call varicosities. They're sort of enlarged bubbles that contain neurotransmitters. You don't see the kind of specialization that you have here. Um, the effects are really important. So in the somatic division, the only message that gets sent is excitatory. There is never a situation where you would want to say to a skeletal muscle, don't do anything, you know, because it doesn't make any sense. The, the only s signal that's worth sending is an excitatory message. In the autonomic division, you've got to be able to send inhibitory messages. Those messages are valuable because you need to be able to say to the heart, for example, slow down, right? So inhib inhibition of the ANS is a valid signal. Um, those are some of the more uh, important features that you want to look at on this table. Um, like I said, we're going to go over the first two items on the previous table uh, in more detail. So here's the first one. The difference, a huge difference between the somatic division and the autonomic division is the number of neurons in the efferent pathway. So in the somatic division, there is only one. In the autonomic division, there are two. So we call this one the preganglionic neuron, neuron number two, the postganglionic neuron. And obviously they communicate in a ganglion. And again, a ganglion is a, a collection of nerve cell bodies that exists outside the central nervous system. So depending on what division you're in, uh, sympathetic or parasympathetic, the ganglia will either be running right along the spinal cord or they'll be out uh, near the, the targets. This does make it a little bit confusing for a lot of folks. Uh, you should be able to answer the question why we have ganglia in the autonomic division in the first place. Why do you have to have these ganglia. Why can't you have just one neuron from the CNS to the target? It works fine in skeletal muscle, so why have two? That's a really critical question. Make sure you know the answer to that one. Um, how the divisions of the ANS are different depends on, uh, I should say, the answer to that depends on whether or not you're an anatomist or a physiologist. So in an anatomist's view, what you guys learned in anatomy, it's all very, you know, complicated in that you have lots of different nerves to worry about and it becomes a huge memorization exercise. And as you guys know, this is not the way um, that we look at things in physiology. So this is the physiologist's view of the sympathetic versus parasympathetic. Recalling that and that uh, the efferent neuron number one is the same in both divisions, it really comes down to uh, neuron number two. So this is basically how the sympathetic and parasympathetic um, divisions are different. So what we're going to do is uh, look at the the critical figures in chapter 11 that kind of summarize um, how the ANS does its job. So here we go. So this is the the simplified view. In the sympathetic division, you have the preganglionic neuron is cholinergic. It releases acetylcholine onto nicotinic receptors, onto the postganglionic neuron. The postganglionic neuron in the sympathetic division is adrenergic, which means it releases norepinephrine. And the effect that that norepinephrine is going to have will depend on what type of uh, receptor this is. And there are different receptors, and we will review those. In the parasympathetic division, both of the neurons are cholinergic. The preganglionic neuron is cholinergic. It releases acetylcholine onto nicotinic receptors. So notice how the preganglionic neurons in both divisions are exactly the same. It's the postganglionic neurons that are different. So in the parasympathetic, the rest and digest system, the neuron number two is also cholinergic. Most of the receptors, we're going to say all for our purposes, 
uh, are going to speak to their targets via muscarinic receptors. Those are inhibitory. So this is sort of the basis of chapter 11. When you add the different adrenergic receptors, you get all the different effects of norepinephrine and epinephrine on their targets. Please notice that I did make this change. Um, all the beta receptors cause an increase in um, cyclic AMP in their target cells. So this is it, you guys. This is figure 1111. Spend a lot of time here. It compares the ANS with the somatic division. Remember, somatic division, only one neuron in the efferent pathway. Always cholinergic, always nicotinic receptors. Parasympathetic is shown here. Both of the uh, neurons are cholinergic. Here's the sympathetic division. This is where you have the cholinergic preganglionic neurons and the adrenergic postganglionic neurons. And here we've got all the different types of um, receptors that are possible. Remember, any target is only going to have one type of receptor, right? Not a mixture. And it adds the last of the pathways, the adrenal sympathetic pathway. This is the only one we haven't talked about yet in this review. There is a proper preganglionic neuron, and like everybody else, it is cholinergic but it does not synapse onto a ganglion. It synapses onto the adrenal medulla, which is modified neurologic tissue, right? So the adrenal gland, which sits superior to the kidney, the medulla is modified, excuse me, modified neurologic tissue. Upon stimulation, this tissue releases epinephrine into the blood. Epinephrine will bind to the same uh, receptors, excuse me, as norepinephrine, but with slightly different sensitivities. And so that's why we have this table going back to this column here. I don't think any of this is particularly important. I'm not going to ask you, okay, on which receptor is norepinephrine more uh, important? Uh, which one is more, you know, sensitive? I, I think this is in debate, but I just wanted you to understand what this column is. It's understanding that epinephrine or norepinephrine will activate all of these receptor types, but not to the exact same degree. Okay, so it really is all about this figure, figure 1111. You go through it um, and you see how almost all the questions that I could ask you really can be answered here. Um, as an example of that, I have, you know, the, the so what, the clinical applications. A lot of those ideas you can see here in uh, table 11.3. All you have to do is understand how these ligands uh, and their receptors work, and then it becomes very obvious. So I can ask you something and, and talk about, um, you know, scopolamine, and all I have, I mean, we haven't talked about it in class, but if you understand that it is an antagonist for a muscarinic receptor, you should be able to say what that drug would do, um, how it would affect, how it would exert its effects on target tissue. So that's the power of understanding how the autonomic division works, and uh, I hope that was helpful.